What's up? Welcome back to the the outskirts of the worm, not the worm proper. We are going to get this cabin built if it kills us. And if it gets any warmer, it's probably going to kill me. Unlike every other build project, this one, I'm trying to make all the lumber first. Which kind of has its pluses and also has its minuses. It's like, the minus is that it gets kind of boring after a while. Not boring, but, you know, it'll take me several, several weeks anyway. Actually, by the time I get all the lumber made and stacked where it needs to be, it'll probably be a couple month project. So a couple videos ago, we cut down all the cedars. I think it'll probably be enough to do all the siding for this thing. Now I'm working on, I got two or three massive white pine trees. One that I've taken down. What's left of it is here. The other two logs have already been milled up. And I've got two more back here. They're both very tall, maybe 120 feet or so. Both of them aren't too healthy. One's missing the top, so the tree's looking like it's dying. The other one, it's huge. It's actually bigger round than this last tree I cut down and 50 feet taller. I just noticed all, all of the needles on it are going brown and I thought maybe, maybe it was just the season or something, but I've walked around and looked at 10 other white pines around here and compared it. And it's definitely, the tree's definitely uh, going downhill, definitely dying which sucks because they're so huge and such cool trees. But the good thing is now I've got all the building uh, materials I need. So I'm not going to force you to watch days and days and weeks of chainsaw milling. But uh, I think uh, I think you guys will like seeing these last two trees cut down. If you only watch uh, tree cutting and stuff on this channel, then uh, you'll think that these trees are quite huge, which I do. If you're watching an arborist channel or something, then uh, <laughs> the tools and trees I work with are puny. So I'll get this last log finished up. It's probably going to take me half the day just to mill this one log, or only half of a log left. It's so slow going because the log is actually bigger than my bar. So I trim the edges of the log down, and still, I got to make it so it just barely pokes out. And with a 50cc saw, 4 horsepower saw, it's somewhat unreasonable to be milling this size log. But, hey, I've been out here over two years just doing this all day, every day, just building stuff with a chainsaw, and... That saw's still going. It might not like it, but it keeps going. <laughs> so as soon as these three trees are down and milled up, I'm gonna go back up to where I wanna build the cabin and start trying to figure out the foundation. I've got a couple of uh, thoughts kind of rattling, real loosely rattling around up there on how I might do it, but nothing's set in stone. It's, it's kind of like more set in silly putty. We'll figure it out. This cabin, this cabin is gonna be sweet. I can't, I kind of can't wait to get it all together so I can start working on the inside. Oh, uh, jet's overhead, that's a new one. Probably coming for me. Look at the size of these boards. That is a lot of two buys right there. This is uh, 17 inches by one and a half by a little over 12 feet. That's a big sucker. For me, for building supplies, that's pretty big. If you were building tables or something, it'd be different, but. Okay, there we go. Well, some serious sap coming out of these pockets. So bizarre. Looks like egg yolks, doesn't it? <laughs> this is uh, pretty close to the last board. It's down to no more two bys out of it. So usually that I just mill up into a one by, get as many one bys as I can, even if it's not full length. Can always use them for something. All right, it's time for tree number two. I just got it all cleared out around here. Always the first step if you don't want to die, not to have anything to trip over right around the tree. And I cleared this out, so I'm gonna have to get it to fall right between this guy and this guy, right down in there, which shouldn't be too big a problem. The tree does have a little bit of lean. It's kind of leaning over there, so I don't really have to do too much screwing to get it to fall over there, hopefully. 
that's as long as it's solid inside. So because so many of you watch all the videos and so much of my time in the videos is cutting down trees, uh, I thought I'd explain a couple things about cutting. I'm not really interested in trying to teach somebody how to cut down a tree only because there are people out there that are so much more qualified to do it than I am. However, I do think if you keep watching the videos, it'd be, in my mind, it would be kind of nice to know like why this same thing's being done over and over and over again. So I'll just try to give you a little overview while I'm cutting this tree of like why each cut goes the way it does and you know why I put a wedge in at this time and not that time, that kind of stuff. And I have heard that some people have cut down trees after having watched these videos. Just like, oh, I'll just do it like he does it. Please don't do that. <laughs> there are a lot of great resources online and even YouTube. If you watch five or six or seven YouTube videos of somebody that you th appears to really know what they're doing, you can kind of put the information together and then probably be able to safely take down a really straightforward tree, like think a tree standing in the middle of a field or something, but cutting down trees that have a lean or there's stuff around it like houses or I don't know, cars, people, that's uh, completely different, that takes practice. There are a lot of the trees that I've cut down since I've been out here that were there something else around it that could be damaged, I just wouldn't have cut down the tree. But luckily out here, the worst thing that happens is I cut it and it falls and sticks in another tree or something. And then I spend half a day trying to figure out how to get it the rest of the way down. I do the conventional cut, which starts by cutting straight in. And then the top cut comes down at an angle. There's also what's called a Humboldt cut, which is a cut straight in. And then you finish the face cut by cutting up like this. I learned the conventional, so that's what I generally do. There's also an open face cut that is... There is no straight in cut. It's kind of an angle here and an angle here. That's really good if you've got to drop a tree just in the right spot. And it's also safer because the key, the tree doesn't tend to kick back as much. And the reason you do this, you cut this out of here and then cut from the back in is that you leave this strip right through the middle of the tree, this hinge. And that's what controls the tree falling in a certain direction. If you were and there are videos all over YouTube of people doing this, but if you were just to go at a tree, like cut from the back all the way through, you don't really have any control of where the tree's gonna go. Like gravity's just gonna take it, but also a terrifying thing is called a barber chair. Good thing about a barber chair is you're only terrified for about half a second before it completely knocks your head off. So it's not really a long lasting tear, but that's, imagine if you cut through here, you get most of the way and then the tree goes over, but the front of this isn't cut. This will stay as one piece and the rest of the tree will just like lift up and kick back. There's a great picture that's all over online that has been for years of like the worst barber chair you've ever seen. Isn't that something? <laughs> but yeah, the, the whole back of the tree will pick right up and if you're standing there, take your head right off. So what made me think of this, to even put this in a video, is uh, every time I'm editing, I notice something that I'm doing that people might not totally understand. I do the first cut in the tree, I'm always leaning back and looking, kind of sighting where it's going to go. If you haven't used a chainsaw a lot, you probably don't know this, but chainsaw have, chainsaws have sights on them. So this, just, this isn't just a fancy racing stripe here. And it goes sort of to the other side, this line here is the the rest of the site. So if you're cutting in this way, you can sight right down that. And provided that everything goes to plan and you do your cut just right, the tree should fall right on that line. So I'll go ahead and do the first cut here and then show you what it looks like. Usually the, the face cut, this little wedge you take out of here is a quarter to a third of the diameter of the tree. If the tree's leaning or there are other factors involved, it can be different. But for just a standard straightforward tree, I usually cut about, yeah, probably close to a third. Yeah, maybe a quarter, maybe one or the other. It's hard to say. So we're somewhere around about a quarter, a third of the way into the tree. And then if you look at this black line right here, I should be aimed right down where we want to go. That looks pretty close. Now I'll finish the conventional notch. I'll cut this one, this way. There are different thoughts as to how much, how big of a notch you want to take out of here. What the notch does is when it, when the tree starts falling and the notch closes, it'll rip the hinge wood out. 
So if you have a really wide notch, the tree won't disconnect from the stump until it's nearly on the ground. If you make a very, very narrow one, sometimes it can be good because the tree will only go a little bit and then disconnect and fall. Sometimes it could be horrible because you only have that control of the tree until that hinge wood rips. So sometimes if I think the tree is going to get hung up halfway down, I might cut a little bit, a little bit narrower face cut so that it's not fully connected and hung up in a tree and I've got to get it off of there. Also the, the Humboldt notch, when you cut up like this instead of down like this, the advantage to that, which I think I've said in other videos, is I think a lot of times loggers will do that because you end up, once you cut the tree down, you end up with this part of the tree that's pretty much flat on the bottom. The way I do it, once I cut this out, then I'm going to have this, this chunk missing out of the tree. So if you're going to turn it into lumber, you got this weird cut out of it. And you end up just cutting it off and losing, you know, half a foot or a foot of tree. The other really, really, really important thing is to, when you make the top cut, has to meet up exactly with the bottom cut. You don't want to take the top cut and go down here too far. And you also don't want the bottom cut to go, go too far in where it doesn't meet up with the top cut because you've just cut into your hinge wood one way or the other. If these don't line up, if it's like this, or it's like this, you've kind of shot the whole project by removing the hinge wood that's going to control the tree. So I almost always, you'll see in almost every tree I cut down, instead of trying to make these corners meet up on the first cut, I always cut just a little bit less and then I go back in and trim it and trim it and trim it until they meet up just right. So you can see I went a little bit short, about an inch short. So I can't leave it like that or that screws up the hinge. Over here I'm pretty close to right on, so I'm just going to keep recutting that until it comes out just right. That looks pretty good. Those met up pretty nicely. It's also really important to get the back cut to come out just in the right spot, which is depending on the size of the tree, like an inch or an inch and a half above this line. And that's so that when the tree falls over, it has something to push back against so you don't get kicked back where the back of the tree shoots back into you. So sometimes I'll take a, a stick and put it in here on either side, and then I can get back behind it and see, at least see where the edges of the face cut are. You can also just start the back cut, go in an inch or something so your saw stays there, and then go in front and look back at it make sure it's online to come up an inch, inch and a half above here so I'm just gonna put a little guideline on here Something else I like to do sometimes, I mean, this tree's got enough lean that it's definitely going that way. There's no chance it's coming back at me. But if it was standing straight up, you put a wedge in just so it barely sits there. And then when you're cutting, you can watch the wedge. If it starts coming up, that means this is closing and the tree's trying to come back on you. If you see it start dropping, then you know the tree's already going over. I had to start that back cut a couple times just to make sure it's in the right spot. So I kind of opened this up a little funny, but We'll, we'll set it in there and just keep an eye on it. <laughs> that sucker took off quick. <laughs> it had a good lean to it. I always try to make a habit of going back through afterwards and kind of critiquing the stump there. See if there's anything I did wrong or could have done differently. This looks pretty good. So you can see this was somewhere between a quarter and a third of the way in. My back cut, as you see, I, I, I don't know if you could see, but I started it two or three, maybe four different times. Put it in and then sighted from up here to see where the bar was, if it was going to come out here. The first time I had it coming out a little high, the other side was coming out low. So it's worth doing it as many times as it takes getting it started to make sure it comes up just right. 
Well, you can see this is pretty equal all the way across, maybe an inch and a half or two inches higher than the, than the face cut, so that's good. And then also my hinge is consistent from this side all the way to that side, which is good. I'm actually a little surprised. This looks kind of uh, textbook to me, the way it came out. It's kind of hard because the, you see I cut this chunk out because I couldn't really see from the back. You know, if you have to start your cut back here, it's really hard to figure out where it's going to come out once you get up here. So I just trimmed some of the junk off there. But because it was a little funky on the back, I'm surprised that it came out quite that perfectly. I mean, that's pretty equal from one side to the next on all the cuts. So that's fantastic. And you can see it fell right exactly like almost to the foot where we aimed it. So obviously it's worth taking your time on every single cut and make sure you do it just right. You know, do a little bit of the cut, stop, look at it, move it around if you had to, do a little bit more of a cut. And if you take your time, it really doesn't take that much longer to fix little stuff as you go. But after you've done it a bunch of times, the whole process, I mean, this is maybe take five minutes to cut this down. Of course, clearing the brush around it and doing all that stuff takes a day. <laughs> but just the tree cutting goes pretty fast. But I mean, when you, when you start doing this, your first tree or two or ten, it could take you, you know, 45 minutes just to do this, just to cut this. But it's no big deal. No big deal if it takes a while. I mean, you're outside having fun with chainsaws, so why are you going to rush that? So you can see what I'm talking about here now for lumber. I'm going to have to cut this off like this. Or, I mean, I, could, I guess I could just be missing a triangle on, on the log that I use, but I'll probably cut it back to here. I didn't even look to see. It actually looks like really good wood. Look at this weird gunk in the middle. It almost looks like a mushroom growing out of there or something. But, hey, this is a great cabin log. It's not very big, but it's nice and straight without a lot of taper to it. And most importantly, not a lot of limbs to clean up. <laughs> you know, I just thought of, I'll put a link in the description, or if I can do it on the screen here, of a video. Uh, it's a guy that does tree service work uh, professionally, and I love this video. I've watched it a whole bunch of times. It's all the different notches, how to do them, why they're done. And he actually cuts down, I don't know, four, five, six uh, trees on the video with each using a different notch. It's really fascinating. I mean, most of them you'll never use, I'll never use. But I think just watching stuff like that gives you some idea of why you're cutting the way you're doing it and things to look out for and pay attention to. So I'll just say it one more time. I know we get sick of hearing people say this stuff, but do your research, don't just take this one video, whatever, consult your doctor first. This might cause tinnitus and irritable bowel syndrome, so, you know, do your research. Don't listen to me, I'm a nutcase. One other thing I just thought of that if you're not somebody that's used a chainsaw a bunch before you might wonder why you do why I do this a certain way like why sometimes I'll cut backwards pulling the saw up instead of down or cutting part way one way and then the rest of the way the other way if you have a log like this and it's suspended on the ends and you cut down from the top of it you make a, a crack like that it pinches, pinches together on your bar and you never get your chainsaw back out. So, so if you cut from the bottom up, the tree can fall this way. It opens up on the bottom and your saw will go through it. Also, and more importantly, when you're cutting down, it's pulling the chips this way at you. And if you cut up, the chain's going this direction and it'll throw the chips away. So you notice when I like debark a log, I always do it this way, pulling up on the saw and not going down on the saw. So you do it this way, all the chips end up on the ground. <laughs> Especially if you, if you try to do it this way, it just goes, it goes all over you. I should just buy stock and Visine for how many times a day I put it in my eyes to get sawdust and chips out of them. So watch, watch which direction the chips go. Not in my face. Oh, we might have to save this for something. That's a pretty nice fork, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know what I'll use it for, but something. 
some furniture or something, or maybe maybe just a giant sling. Ooh, a giant slingshot. Don't you see something cool in that? I don't know what, but I'm not cutting it up. You can see the end of that is sitting right on the ground, so that's a lot of weight on that cut. And as you cut down in here, you can just watch this start closing up. As soon as it starts closing, you got to stop cutting and you cut from the bottom up now if you could, but I can't get the saw in there. So all I can do is uh, put that in there to hold it for a minute and then try not to jam the bar into the ground. <laughs> Nice. That is a sweet log right there. Even that little hole that was in the middle didn't even go up six inches. Oh, it's great. And I measured it out. It's going to be, I can get at least two 12 foot logs out of here that are almost perfectly straight. so much sap. Gotta cut it off. Oh, too heavy. <laughs> wow. That's the short one, too. Forgot to peel the log. Screw it. Man, one nice thing about milling up a whole bunch of huge logs is when you get to a reasonable sized one, it seems like it's just flying through there. This is what I'd like. I'd like a pile of like 14 inch perfectly straight pine logs. And if I could get them without knots, I'd appreciate it. You just see what you can figure out. That's <laughs> so good. Thank you, Ryobi. Uh-oh. That's a good log when the bars don't stick out. Except, that might be so long that the mill doesn't fit on there. Will it fit? Will it fit? Oh, to the, to the half inch. Now that's a perfect log right there. Need to find a forest that only has those. And if, if the, uh, the tops are already cut off and the limbs are taken care of, that would be even better. I'll keep my eyes open.
you know this uh hand planer you guys know i use it all the time when i'm doing this kind of stuff but it's kind of become an indispensable tool for chainsaw milling i don't know if you remember but i think it was last summer maybe i bent the bar on the chainsaw and i still don't know sometimes it's possible to do that just by setting it down uh, with this mill because it's only clamped on to the beginning of the bar and not the tip like the bigger mills are so if you stepped on this you know you you could bend bend the bar up there and you can with a bigger saw if you're just you know using it for regular cutting i mean sometimes you bend if you've got a four or five foot bar six foot eight foot bar you bend it you could kind of bend it back and because you're just cross cutting it doesn't make a difference exactly how straight it is i mean clearly you don't want a bunch of s curves in it because it won't cut right and it'll heat up but you definitely don't want it bent when you're uh milling with a mill like this one thing i notice is if i'm milling along and there's a knot in the log i could cut right through the middle of it fine if the knot's offset so the bar hits it on one side it can actually like push the bar up or down and it happens such a small amount that usually you don't even notice it this knot was enough i think the bar went underneath it i think the yeah the majority of the knots on that log and the whole thing all of a sudden got really hard to push along usually it kind of feeds itself if it's uh sharp and tuned just right the saw kind of pulls itself along but it got to be where it's really pushing i could see the bar had gone down to get around this knot i did a little bit of trickery and got it through there i can feel there's a little bit of a divot there so on that side there'll be a little bit of a high spot that doesn't matter so much. I mean, that's just going to get used for two by fours and two by sixes and stuff. But if I were to have a bulge on this side of it, the next cut, the mill's going to run on top of this. You don't want it to, the mill to go up over the top like that. So I use this quite a bit to take those uh, inconsistencies out. If they're small, if they're just little ripples and stuff, it doesn't make any difference. But a lot of times on the very end, when you get, except for the very first cut where the mill's sitting on the bars, it can run all the way off the end. When you're doing all the rest of the cuts, the mill has a tendency to want to fall off the end. So if you just keep going cut after cut after cut and each one falls off a little bit more, by the time you get down to the bottom board, you have this big like <laughs> down curve in the board. So what I do when I get to the end here is I actually pick up on the front of the mill a little bit so it doesn't, do, it doesn't fall off. And if anything, I err on the side of coming up a little bit. And I can feel right here it's come up. So before I do the next cut, I always take the, the uh, planer. I don't know if you can see in there, but it actually, that did flatten it right back out. So, I mean, yet another way I use this thing. God, I use this thing all the time. Until I moved out here, I didn't know I needed one of these. But... There's hardly a battery tool that you don't need, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh yeah, it's a big lump right there. Alright, one more to go. Just starting to rain. Looks like the rest of the day is kind of hosed. Which is okay, because I'm freaking worn out. But I'll, I'll at least put an hour in on this big log here. I like to use these for big heavy logs especially when the ground's uneven because if i put them on really low down on the log it gives you just a little bit of lift the ball on here is not very high up but it's better than having the winch cable go to the top of this and just bury the front in the ground Just ripping it apart. Huh. I'm putting them down so low so it lifts the log up a little bit. They really need to go up higher, but there's a stump right here in front of it, so if it doesn't go over, we're gonna have problems. Hopefully that works. Jumpin' Jehoshaphat, or Jiminy Christmas, or Great Googly Moogly, or whatever. We got a lot of rain. I went to sleep last night. 
I don't know, like 10 o'clock or something, and I could hear the thunder rolling in. It was just supposed to be like an hour or something. Had to put earplugs in, and then I woke up a couple times in the night because I could see the flashes through my closed eyes and through the top of the tent. This morning, I got a little break, so I went into the man cave, got my coffee in there, and have been locked in there for like, I don't know, eight hours, 10 hours or something. It freaking poured. I think we got like at least three inches of rain in 12 hours or 15 hours or something. It was nuts. But look at, look at how much water is on the trail when I drive out here. This is just the little trail that I cut out to get back to these three pine trees. So you guys saw all of it when it went in. It's totally flooded. Prime in Italy. Prime in Italy. Oh, nice. It's not flooded out here. I didn't really realize how much of a hillside this is. I was afraid I wasn't gonna be able to mill today because there'd be so much water, but it looks pretty well drained. You know, I can't go more than a couple days without milling or my hands start shaking. I need the vibrations of the chainsaw to even out my uh, hands and my temperament. I got this one all set up last night before I called it, a, called it a day. It's the last one from that tree. Man, these logs are so great. They're just like just the right size and they're so straight you don't even have to roll them around figure out which side to put up or down well i guess i still have this log left but it's got must be like an old woodpecker hole in it there it's so funny how huge some of them can get over time one there too so i don't know i'm gonna hold on to that and see if see if i can find some use to like I'd like to mill a board off of it just the very top and then mill the next one and actually have that hole in it of course, I have no idea what I do with that, but I'll find some use. I might need, uh, I don't know, fancy cup holder or something. So this was the first one. That's the one we just did there. And then I cut this one. And actually, if I get this uh, log milled up today and still have time, I'm gonna take this one down. This is the one I wasn't gonna take down, but all the all the uh, needles are getting pretty yellow brown on the entire tree. It's not just uh, not just a branch or two. Oh, uh, actually, you know, you can see from here, up, these branches up here, that's the very top of the tree, and they're all dead, so this guy's dying out too. It would kind of worry me a little bit that all these trees are dying, but they're really not. I think, I really think that a lot of these, because they're so much taller than the rest of the trees around here, I think, I think they all get hit by lightning, because it'd just be like the top third of the tree that's dead, and the rest of it's pretty good, so you just end up with a couple massive branches coming out in the tops. Like, it's been, that stuff's been dead for 10, 20, 30 years, probably. Maybe 10, maybe 20. Could be 30. Yeah, actually, it is dying. You could see the branches up here have most of the needles missing off of them. And those are some of the main branches. Oh yeah, all of them. Even the side branches up here barely have any needles left. That's okay. That makes me feel good. Then I don't have any problem taking the trees down if they're if they're on their way out. Well, like I said, this is on a hillside, and all those big puddles up there are slowly draining down here. It's just seeping through the ground and puddling up. This was uh, dry sawdust a minute ago underneath here, and 
all of a sudden I was like, what's going on with my pants? Look at that. Just, ugh, soaked through. What can you do? I mean, it's still, I don't know, three to five percent better to do this than to be in a cubicle. And a one incher. Wow, got a lot of lumber out of that tree. That was great. One, two, three, four, five one and a half inch boards and a one inch board. Not bad. 12 feet, three or four inches. That right there is the floor for the cabin. Oh, the floor joists. Huh, I wonder what we're gonna do for flooring. Probably aspen. There's a bunch of downed aspens around here that need to be milled up. Man, I hate those trees. They're all huge. They're all dead or dying. They fall down, they ruin stuff, they get in the way. And if you find one that's not rotten in the middle and you want to mill it, it is the slowest stuff to mill. It's really, this chainsaw and mill is not the correct setup for uh, milling those aspen trees. But it, there's a lot of it and it makes really hard flooring as you use it on the roofs too, but it's not the best for roofs because it's so heavy. I don't know. I mean, I've never let any of it dry out, so maybe... Maybe by the time the, the building seasons, the roof's not that heavy, I don't know. Oh, I gotta say, I feel disgusting. Super sweaty because it's so humid and then sitting in that, all my clothes are kind of soaked and then they got that real fine sawdust all over. Ugh. It's a good thing uh, I know this dude that built a pretty badass shower up there. I'll have to see how long the line is for that. It's time for the biggest and last one, hopefully. With any luck, these three trees will do the framing for the entire, the entire cabin. Will it do the floor and all the walls and the roof? I don't know. It's uh, hard to say. It seems like a lot of tree, but this stuff goes pretty fast once you start nailing it together. I don't know if you can tell the size of the limbs on that thing, but man, they're huge. I'm kind of feeling like I might have to build something back here. You know, now that it's all cleared out, I mean, it was like probably literally half the work out here was just clearing this area out. I don't know if you can tell, but this is where the other trees were. I cut uh, one here and one back there and they fell this way. So the runway's kind of back behind me. And there were a few other, uh, some decent sized trees, maybe like three that I left. And uh, I was able to knock the other trees down either side of those. And I just had to clear them all out because this thing is so massive. Luckily, one of them was a spruce tree, and I got some really nice spruce logs out of it. Real nice and straight. Not huge, but uh, haven't gotten to play with much spruce yet. So it'll be fun to mill those up.
look at all that pollen. The cloud of pollen that came out of that sucker. Whew. That took some uh, some smacking and what? Oh, dude, it's a perfect tree. Man, I don't get it. Look at these uh, needles. So many of the needles are brown tipped and yellow otherwise and missing on a lot of branches. So still didn't expect it to, the stump to look like this with no rot. I just don't get it. Yeah, that sucker's perfect and monstrous. You're getting a pretty good cut. This was, uh, you know, an inch and a half up. This one ended up level, which is, it's not ideal, but worked fine. Even hinge all the way across. Good enough for ringworm work, you know what I mean? <laughs> Look at this. All you did is just sat there and like blinked your eyes and then, uh, shabam. The whole day of my life and sweat is gone. And look at the size of this thing. Isn't that a beaut? Holy cow. That is fantastic. I got about, uh, I might get like two, two and a half good 12 foot logs out of this. And then they're just tons of knots and stuff. But I mean, I won't use the super knotty stuff for, you know, structural stuff, two by fours and whatnot. But find a, find a use for them. Maybe frames for tables or something. I don't know. Looks like at least two massive 12 footers like the skinny end of the second 12 footer is going to be 16 inches or something so this is going to be amazing this will be great yeah i'm gonna chop this up and then uh we'll go up to camp and uh show you where i think i'm gonna put the cabin not where i thought i was going to actually i didn't know where i was going to so i left it up to sarah and it only took her about 30 seconds she said right there and I said okay hadn't thought about that but that looks great When the, when the log's this wide, it kind of throws off your idea of how long it is. It seems like the tape measure is wrong. That's 12 feet. Wow. Yeah, man, when you get a log this big around, it really messes with your brain geometry, you know what I mean? That looks like it's 9 feet long, 8 feet long. That's 12 feet. I mean, it's possible my tape measure shrunk overnight. Pinched it good when it fell off of there. <laughs> I was careful when I was cutting it. This was uh, the crack was opening up, so I should have been all right to keep cutting, but the whole thing fell off of there. That is a solid pinch. I think I can get it out somehow. Otherwise, I got another saw, even though the other saw won't reach all the way through. Ah! Man, things just went sideways really fast. Look at this mess. <laughs> it's maybe not the best place to leave my wedge bag overnight. Oh. <laughs> that is nasty. <laughs> what a dope. Decided I got way plenty enough 12 footers already. I'm just gonna use 12s for the floor. I guess I'm not that used to planning ahead <laughs> for all this stuff. Because normally I would make the lumber for one little part of the building project. I'd put it together, go make more lumber, do the next part, and this I'm trying to get most of it ahead of time. So I'm cutting all these 12 footers and I only need 12 footers for the floor. Once I get to framing the walls, I'm going to need a bunch of, I don't know, how tall do you make walls? Eight feet or something? So I just did a, that was a 10 foot, so I got a 12, big fat 12 footer, 10 footer. It looks like maybe I'll do an eight footer for the next one. That'd be for framing walls. Try to do whatever possible to make the least amount of waste. Of course, when you don't really plan or write any of this down ahead of time, it's kind of a crapshoot. Let's do eight. Eight sounds good. <laughs> Did it again, what a dope. So 
let's go look at the build site. So I'm kind of thinking right here where this big down tree is. You'd see my tent over there, the lean-to's over there, the man cave's over there. And there's kind of an island here. There's a trail right on the other side of these down trees coming up to camp. And then this is the other way into camp. And like right here would actually be pretty nice. That tree or those bunch of down trees are the ones that came down like I think it was in the fall or something last fall when we had that huge windstorm and I came back and had to cut my way back in here. So those have been needing to be cleaned up for a long time. Unfortunately, that does mean that I got to mill those trees up before I can start the foundation because those giant aspens are way too big uh, for me to move with this. So I, I have to mill them in place. So in order to get that area cleaned out, I'm gonna have to chop that up and mill all of it. It's not really what I wanna do right now, especially after spending, what, a month and a half down here cutting and milling trees. But milling up that one aspen tree probably is enough flooring for the entire thing. I'm sure I can get 200 square feet out of that. Actually, I think there are two of them there. Let's go have a look-see. Probably be somewhere, yeah, right around that tree there. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that root ball. Sometimes when you cut a big tree like that, you take all the weight off of it, the root ball will actually lay back down. It's hard to say if that's actually gonna happen. Otherwise, I don't know what I'll do. I don't know how I'm gonna get that out of there. <laughs> Maybe that'll be underneath the cabin. Yeah, let's see how much, how much is gonna have to be moved to get in there. So I think I showed in an earlier video, this is a hillside right here that I was thinking of building on. It would be a lot of, oh my gosh, so many more trees to take down. Got to take down anything that could potentially fall on the cabin, which would be pretty much everything you can see along the edge here, as well as some more all the way over here, and even these aspens here, because they're tall enough to reach over there. But I showed uh, Sarah that area, and she said, why don't you just build it right here? And I don't have any reason why not, so let's do it. We already cleared out a lot of the really scary trees here uh, because Tito's tent platform is right back there. So you can actually see sky here, unlike a lot of the places out here. That saves me a lot of work not having to cut them down. I think it'd be like somewhere right here. What do you think? That look good? Yeah, maybe, well, maybe just about where these trees are. So one side's gonna be, I guess that would be the long side maybe which is what, I don't know, 16 feet or 17 or something, I can't do math. 12 feet by something gets you 200 square feet. So maybe like right around here. I think that'd be cool. There's the trail, it just drove up over here, goes by the tent, and then the other trail is right here going out of here. Having access like this on both sides is really nice too. It means I don't have to cut new trails in here to bring building materials and hauling logs around and whatnot. I like this. I think this is going to be good. I was also just talking to Sarah, telling her what I had in mind, which is not much, but uh, 12 feet by something. And then I want a, I want a porch on it. Even though I'm not going to really use this except for the middle of the winter, I'd still at some point like to have like a little screened in porch on it. So it's going to be 12 by whatever the other side is like this. And then the roof will go this way along the top, I guess. And I guess I could put, if I did a porch, I could do it on the end. And then the roof line would go all the way like this and maybe off the end. The tough thing is just the amount of physical labor it takes to do this. And I really want to get this done by this fall, making all the lumber myself and whatnot. I just don't know how much lumber it's going to take or how many more trees would have to be cut. I really don't want to cut a lot more trees. So I guess what I could do is just build this part of it, and I could do this later as an add-on. Let's see, although it would be nice if the roof just went all the way out and ended up over top of this as well. Then again, I guess if the roof came out like this, and I wanted a screened-in porch, you know, I could bring that out over the porch, or I could just build the main building and then later on put another roof a little bit lower coming out. I think. I'm going to do just the building, worry about the porch later. Hmm. So, all right, we're just going to go with the cabin floor, figure out the porch later. Tomorrow, tomorrow's a high of 65. Yes. That's 
so great. I wish it was 55, but I can do 65 just fine. I got uh, I got 18 bags of 80 pounds of quick crete. And the reason I got 18 is that's the maximum amount that can fit in the little trailer I have. <laughs> so I'm just gonna use that, see how far it goes. I don't really know how I'm gonna do the foundation to this thing. I mean, the way the ground is here, so much rock and boulder and everything, I don't know that I'll actually be able to dig out and pour bags into the hole, you know, with like a four by four, four by six or whatever, like you would a normal, you know, fence post or a post. Ooh, I just fill in raindrops or a support post for, uh, you know, a deck or something. So I don't know. We'll figure something out. We'll see how far 18 bags gets us. And if I need to, I can make another four hour trip to get more concrete. All right. I don't know about you, but I need some food. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. We'll, we'll do some stuff with chainsaws. <laughs>